Hey there, church. Hope you are doing well today. Today we are looking at Exodus chapter 20 and looking at the Ten Commandments. Uh, And we are going to unpack this really important chapter over the next three weeks. Today we'll do kind of an overview. Uh, Next week we're going to look at uh, Commandments 1 through 4 and kind of the vertical relationship that we have with God. Uh, And then the week after that we'll look at the last six commandments and the horizontal relationship we have with other people. But today I want to give just kind of an overview of the Ten Commandments. Why are they here? Why are they good? And I want to start by reflecting on the famous parable of the prodigal son. Right In the story of the prodigal son, there is a young son. And this young son is a rule breaker. He's a rule skeptic. He goes to his father and says, I want to leave the home. I want to be free from your rules. And I want to go out in the world to do whatever I want. And eventually the son comes back to the father after finding that that world is unsatisfying. And the father lovingly takes him in. They throw this big party and it's it's this beautiful ending to the story. But at the end of the story, we meet another character, which is the older brother. And the older brother is not a rule breaker. He is a rule follower. The father comes to him and says, come and enjoy this party. And the son says, I have always been perfect. I have always obeyed the rules. You should be worshiping me and kissing my feet. So we have these two sons that both approach rules differently. And I'm curious for those of you watching, which son do you most sympathize with? Are you more of a rule breaker and a rule skeptic? Or are you more of a rule follower? Now for me, I'm more like the older son. I'm sure most of you are probably like that as well. I'm a rule follower right? But the thing that's interesting about these two approaches to rules is that whether you are like the younger son being a rule breaker or you're like the older son being a rule follower, I would argue that both hate rules. Both hate rules. Obviously, the younger son hates the rules because he leaves his father's home to go into a world of no rules and responsibilities. But I would argue that for those of us like the older son, we also hate rules. As a rule follower, I follow the rules because they bring a sense of of safety and security. But at the same time, they also bring me a sense of anxiety a sense that I could fail at any moment, a sense that I could get in trouble at any moment for not properly obeying the rules. And what that means is that regardless of what category you fall into, we as human beings are just naturally people that do not like and do not trust laws and rules. And yet today, we come to one of the most important, biggest passages about the rules and laws of God, the Ten Commandments, the fundamental rules that we are called to obey as his children. So what do we make of these? What do we make of these major rules as people that do not like or trust rules? Well, what we're going to see today is this. God's law, his Ten Commandments, are not evil. They are a gift. They are a good gift given to God's children which leads us to an abundant life in him. How do we see that? How do we, how do we get to a place of even acknowledging that? And what I want to do today is spend most of our time looking at verse 2. Because in verse 2, we really understand the fullness and the context of the Ten Commandments. Without verse 2, we, li- we lose the beauty and the gift that is the Ten Commandments. So let's begin by looking at verse 2. So in verse 2, God says to Israel, before even laying out commandment number 1, the first thing that God says is this, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. In this one short verse, we have a history lesson, right? It's a history lesson condensed in a few words. God says, I am Yahweh. I am the God that you know personally. I'm the God that has given you my personal name. I have walked with you. I have loved you. I have cared for you. I have a dedicated, intimate relationship with you. And not only that, but as Yahweh, he's done something for his people, right? He's not just rescued them from some kind of obscure, abstract, spiritual slavery. He's rescued them from a literal, physical slavery in the land of Egypt 
a place where they were, they were harmed, they were yelled at, they were oppressed, they were whipped and beaten. God says, I came in and I freed you from the clutches of physical, earthly slavery, and I rescued you, and I gave you freedom. That's what God starts with in the Ten Commandments. But not only is it a history lesson that we see in verse 2, but there's covenantal language, something that we've talked about all throughout the book of Exodus. There's covenantal language, meaning there's language of relationship. There's language that refers back to the promises of God that he originally made with Abraham. It reminds them of the covenantal relationship they have with God. So let's explain that for a second. Because all the way in Genesis chapters 12, 15, and 17, God makes with Abraham what is typically called the Abrahamic covenant. And in this Abrahamic covenant, God chooses Abraham out of his own grace and his own mercy and his own love. And he says, Abraham, I want to bless you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you with numerous descendants, and I'm going to form a relationship with you. I will be your God. I will be their God. We will have this ongoing relationship everywhere we go. But not only that, by my presence and by my grace and my love, I will bless all of you. I will bless you and I will send you into the world and you will be a blessing to other people. That's what God offers up in the Abrahamic covenant. And if there's one word that we could use to encapsulate and define the Abrahamic covenant, it's promise. God makes an unconditional promise to Abraham to stay in relationship with him and bless him and his children to be a blessing to others. God reaffirms this with Abraham. He reaffirms it with Abraham's son Isaac. He reaffirms it with Isaac's son Jacob. And we looked at, I believe two weeks ago in Exodus 19, that he reaffirms it with Moses and Israel. On Mount Sinai, he comes to them and says, here's the covenant. It's still true. Do you agree to follow me and abide by it? And the people say, yes, amen. But now we come to what is commonly known as the Mosaic covenant, God's covenant with Moses. And in God's Mosaic covenant, it's much the same thing that we see with Abraham. He says, you're going to obey me. If you obey me and you follow me, then I will continue to walk with you and bless you. But the difference of the Mosaic Covenant is God begins rolling out these rules and these laws, starting with the Ten Commandments. He starts rolling out these rules and these laws that the people are supposed to follow and obey in order to stay obedient and faithful to God. Now, how do the Abrahamic Covenant and the Mosaic Covenant fit together? Are they competing does the Mosaic Covenant replace the Abrahamic Covenant? No. They fit together like puzzle pieces. The Mosaic Covenant will go on to unpack and explain what was already true in the Abrahamic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant fits under the umbrella of the Abrahamic Covenant, where God is saying, you've always had to be obedient to me. You've always had to be faithful to me. But now I'm going to explain to you in excruciating detail what that looks like through the giving of the Ten Commandments and the unfolding of the hundreds of laws that are to come. So one way to think about this is like this. I have a couple of really good friends, and they met in college in Campus Crusade for Christ. And they kind of started to just hang out as friends in big group settings, but then they began to date. And then eventually they became exclusive, right? Boyfriend, girlfriend, we're only dating each other. And, and the intimacy began to grow, and the love began to grow. And eventually they got engaged, right? She gets an engagement ring. They're, they're growing closer and closer together until finally they have the wedding day. And they stand before God, and they stand before their pastor, and they enter into a binding legal covenantal agreement where they say, until death, I will commit myself to you, and you will commit yourself to me no matter what. And this leads to increased love and intimacy until eventually they are living in the same home, and they are sharing the same bed, and they are at the peak of love and infatuation and beauty. And yet, this causes them to have a conversation that they've never had to have before. They have to have the toilet seat conversation. Who will be the one 
in this intimate household of love to put down the toilet seat. On her side, she says, well, listen, I'm, I'm the woman. I always need it down. You should just always put it down for me. And on his side, he says, well, listen, hey, when I was growing up, it was every man for themselves. It was every woman for themselves. If you needed the toilet seat down, you did it yourself. But as their relationship grew and grew and intimacy grew and grew, they had to form this rule. They had to form this law. And they and we go on to do more and more of that in our uh, in our in our marital relationships. Now the point of that is to say in God's relationship with his people, he gives these laws as a blessing. He gives them as clarity. He gives them to clear up confusion. He gives them to say this will help our relationship. We won't need to fight or quarrel or guess or be anxious. This is what you are called to do in order for us to have a good relationship. And church, I think we get that. We get that intellectually. We understand it. It makes sense, right? But the issue is, as we talked about in the beginning, even if we can acknowledge the goodness of God's laws and rules, we still have this inner aversion to them. I get it, but I don't want to have to obey. Can't God just kind of let it go? And this is why verse 2 is so important. So let's look at verse 2 again. God starts his commandments by saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. What do we lose from the Ten Commandments if we forget verse 2? If we forget the loving relationship of verse 2, what are we left with? We're just left with rules. We're just left with laws for law's sake. If we forget verse 2 and we neglect the loving relationship of God that we see in verse 2, God ceases to be this loving Father. He ceases to be Yahweh. He ceases to be this God that, that enters into our grief and our difficulty and walks with us and loves us and cares for us and meets our needs and whose heart just wells up at the sight of us. We lose all of that if we lose verse 2 and instead God becomes a rule giver, a task master, a slave driver. If we forget the loving relationship of verse 2, we look at God and he looks like a Catholic nun, holding a ruler in his hand ready to slap our knuckles if we do anything wrong. If we lose the relationship, God begins to look more and more like an angry judge in the sky who will send you to hell if you miss church or if you drive 10 miles over the speed limit on your way to church. Without the loving relationship of verse 2, God begins to look like an abusive father who will smack you across your face if you say or do anything wrong. Without the loving relationship of verse 2, we ask the question of today's sermon, which is why does God give the Ten Commandments and why should we obey them? And without verse 2, the answer that we get is, is because God is God. He's in charge. He sets the rules. You are a rule follower. Obey or feel God's wrath. Without the loving relationship of verse 2, God is a God to be feared. He's a God to be appeased. And the Ten Commandments are not a gift. And they don't bring freedom. They bring us deeper into slavery. Church, that's scary. And yet, it's nothing new. <laughs> This is the lie that we have seen and heard from the beginning all the way back with Satan in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. God creates Adam and Eve and he gives them the garden and it's beautiful and it's wonderful. And he says, enjoy everything that's here. Name the animals. And he gives them a mission and a purpose to tend the garden and to be fruitful and multiply and extend to the ends of the earth. But he gives them one rule. Don't eat of that tree. It's not going to be good for you. And Satan weasels his way into the garden, and he whispers in their ear, and he says, yeah, all this is great, but if God really loved you, then why would he give you that rule and that law? If God really loved you, he would want you to be free and uninhibited. If God really loved you, he would not force you to act or be a certain way church, and we're still believing that lie today. 
One of the things that's truly sad about the culture that we currently live in is that this lie has been sold, it has been bought, it has been retold, it has been promoted, it, it is being championed all around us every single day. The, the prevailing idea today of the good life, the prevailing idea of what it truly means to be happy and free is that you should be free from rules and laws and authority. You should be free from any boundaries and restrictions that hold you back from loving and doing and saying and being whoever you want to be. The culture around us says if you want to be free, do what you feel. If you want to be free, pursue your desires, be uninhibited, run from anyone or anything that sets rules or laws or boundaries in your way. That's what the culture says every single day. Look at all these paths, taste and see the beauty of all of them, be uninhibited. And church, it is a lie. It is Satan's lie from the garden being repackaged and resold to us every single day. And the one silver lining is that as we go deeper and deeper in that direction, scholars and writers are beginning to see that it's not true. Counselors, right? Counselors that I've talked with, that are talking with real people that are honestly living in that world, are beginning to see that it's a lie. What they're beginning to see is this worldview is not working, right? Look, look at our children that are growing up in that worldview. Depression is on the rise. Suicide is on the rise. Anxiety, fear, worry, uncertainty is on the rise. Great, I'm free from laws. I can do anything I want, but that makes me feel unstable. It makes me feel scared. What's my identity? What's my purpose? We look around and no one is happy. No one is fulfilled, but we keep buying the same lie over and over and over again. And church, it's not just out there. It's here. It's in my heart. It's inside the walls of our church. This brokenness, this, this buying of the lie, right? Ask any Christian man that's in college right now, any, any, any young man that is a Christian in college, ask them, what does it mean to be sexually pure? And be specific. And they will hem and they will haw and they will find every excuse in the book that they can find to why pornography is okay. At least it's not sex, right? Ask any unsatisfied husband or wife what it means to commit adultery and be specific and they will hem and haw and find every reason why it's perfectly fine for me to go get a cup of coffee with that, that coworker of the opposite sex. Ask any Christian Republican or any Christian Democrat what does it mean to pursue justice. And the Republican will tell you all day about caring for the life of the unborn child and yet will never talk about the immigrant. And the Democrat will talk, tell you all the ways that you can care for the immigrant and they'll never talk about abortion. Church, what are the laws that you sidestep? What are the laws that you justify breaking? I've once heard someone describe American Christianity like this. Um, they said, you know, it's, it's like going to someone's home for a dinner party. And while you're there, the person says, hey, as long as you are in my home, I will protect you. As long as you are in my home, I will care for your well-being and I will defend you from enemies. And we say, wow, that's awesome. That's so great. And we step in the threshold of the house and we say, will you still protect me here? And they say, yeah, I'll, I'll protect you there. And we step out the front door, down the front steps, and we say, will you still protect me here? And they say, yeah, I'll, I'll still protect you there. And then we go all the way to the street, to the sidewalk, and we say, will you still protect me here? And pretty soon, we're as far away as we can be. Instead of going deeper into the house, instead of going deeper into love and safety and protection, we, we push our luck. We get farther and farther and farther away because we want to be set free of boundaries and rules and restrictions. And yet what we see in Scripture and what we see in our culture is that freedom is not found in being free of laws and rules. Freedom is not found in having hundreds of paths to choose from and tasting a little bit of each of them. Freedom, the abundant life, the good life, is found in having one true good path and pursuing it with everything that you have. 
And that is what God our Father gives to us here in the Ten Commandments. So let's, let's recap by looking at verse 2 one last time. God says in verse 2, before he gives his Ten Commandments, he says, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. In verse 2, before he gives his laws and his rules, God says, my relationship with you precedes the giving of the Ten Commandments. The promise of a relationship that I made with Abraham precedes the giving of the laws and the rules that I give to Moses. God says, I save you, and I rescue you, and I love you, and I care for you before you say or do anything right or wrong. That precedes everything. And what that means is that the Ten Commandments do not enter in and disrupt that or interrupt that or, or, or crush our freedom. The Ten Commandments do the opposite. They are a gift given to us out of relationship that we have with a loving and glorious God who says this will make your life richer. It will make you freer. It will lead to an abundant life lived with me. And we will spend the next two weeks unpacking the beauty of the Ten Commandments. But for now, what we need to see is that these Ten Commandments, the laws of God, are a guardrail. They are the gift of a guardrail, where God puts a guardrail on our right side and our left side. And he says, do not sway to the right, because it leads to evil and brokenness and darkness that is corrupting you. And he puts a guardrail on our left and says, don't go to the left, because in that direction, you will harm others, and you will harm yourself, and you will go, ast uh, uh, you'll go astray. God says, I will protect you from the darkness and the evil and the paths around you that want to harm you. But the guardrails also keep us moving in one direction, not trying this path, not trying that path, but keeping us on the one good, true, right path, which ultimately moves us forward to him. It moves us to him, church. The guardrails that God gives to us protects us from the millions of paths that cry out to us and say, I am good. It protects us from Satan whispering in our ear and saying, God would not impose rules. Rules, rules will just do you harm. They keep us safe and protect us and lead us on that one true path to God. And that's good news. Because what Augustine of Hippo, the most famous theologian of all time, says is that our hearts are restless. They're restless. Their hearts are restless. My heart's restless. Your heart is restless. Our hearts are restless until they find rest in God. Our hearts are restless until they find rest in God. So we follow the rules. We live within this path that is surrounded by guardrails and we move closer to God Almighty. Church, at the end of the day, the problem is not that we just, we just don't like rules, right? The problem is not just that rules are unsettling to us. The problem is that we don't trust the rule giver. We don't trust and fully love and appreciate the law giver. And so when God comes in the flesh as Jesus Christ, he doesn't come to abolish the law. He doesn't say, this was a bad idea, it's evil, the laws are bad. No. He doesn't come and say, well, that, that didn't really work out, that was a failed experiment, let's get away, Let, let's do away with that. No. Because the laws are good. They are right. They do communicate who God is and how we should live. But instead, Christ comes and he fulfills the law. He upholds the law. He does what we cannot do. He perfectly is obedient to God's laws. But more than that, Christ comes and he gives us a new heart. He gives us a heart that can begin to love and trust the lawgiver. He gives us a pure and real heart which can begin to pursue God. He comes and he dies to cleanse us of our waywardness and our sidestepping and fill us with his spirit, which guarantees and affirms an eternal relationship with God the Father. That's ultimately what Christ gives to us. He gives us what the Ten Commandments cannot do on their own. He gives us the relationship with the God that we so desperately need and desire. He puts our hand in the hand of God the Father and says, You are home. Church, 
rules on their own, including even the Ten Commandments, they can be oppressive. And yet a life lived completely void of rules and laws is equally as impressive. But God calls us to stand in the middle. He says, cherish the Ten Commandments because they are a gift given by your Father. And we should seek to obey the Ten Commandments and the laws out of our love and our trust of the one who wants to draw us deeper and deeper into relationship with him. Church, and that's why Christ comes to us. That's why Christ comes and on the night he's betrayed, he breaks his body, he breaks his blood, right? He comes and he says, this is my body given for you, and this is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Church, may we live in remembrance of him. May we live in obedience and love for him because he first loved us. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you that you are a, a God that does not just send us into the world to find our own way. You are not just a God that says, hey, there are no boundaries. Just pursue and be and do whatever you want. No, Lord, you, you show us the right and good way, which is ultimately a life lived with you. May we love you. May we trust you. May we seek to, to love you and enjoy you more fully so that your rules and your laws will be a delight for us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, church.